there was a time when our leaders did still the pendulum, reduce uncertainty, uh, bring more certainty, cut the dr debt dramatically, um, and actually shrink big government. It, it wasn't Ronald Reagan's time. It wasn't Bill Clinton's time. They controlled something, but they didn't shrink it back down in, in a dramatic way. Um, it was the 1920s when the US was coming out of World War I. Um, there was a bad situation, and it was rectified. All those glorious things I've described, described above, uh, low unemployment, low inflation, good jobs, less work for the same money, and less debt, more ideas, patent registration was strong in the 20s, more new companies. So tonight, I'm going to tell you a story about that period. It's really about people. It's about two people. It's about how politicians respond to life. Um, we talked about getting to yes. So tonight is about getting to no. It's about these men who got to know, who said no. The first who started to get to know but couldn't keep it up was Warren Harding, uh, who was elected president in 1920. The second who did get to know, say no more successfully, was his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, who became president in 1923 when Harding died and served until March 1929. Coolidge is the hero. His nose lasted longer and made what Harding began real, made a new normal. Um, alongside, there are a few other characters to the 1920 stories, people who helped Harding and Coolidge to get to know, help their no saying succeed, and it did. Um, I want to give you just a couple facts about the 1920s to carry away, uh, all you really need to know. The growth in the Coolidge time averaged 4% or more real, nominal, however you bake it. The debt went down by a third from the war with several presidents, and you want to count Wilson a little bit in there. They got their debt down by a third, the national debt. Um, and when Coolidge left office in 1929, so many years later, after 23, the federal government was smaller than when he came in. Real terms, nominal terms. So tonight I'll be telling you their story and how they did it. Um, it takes a few minutes, so I'm grateful to the Fred and Mary Koch Foundation, I'm just getting to know, to Mr. Napoli, my fellow New Yorker, um, to Jerry, my ally and great teacher, um, and to Gilder Lehrman, of course, Mr. Gilder and Mr. Lehrman. Mr. Lehrman has a new book out about gold, in fact, which I, I saw recently, um, for providing this time and for your patience as well. So the story starts with a challenge, and that challenge was World War I and the sudden debt. They had debt of about a billion dollars, which was around the time of the war, before the war, about the size of government, and the debt went up to $26 billion. What a change for the country uh, for, uh, to get over. There was inflation after the war. There was terrible joblessness. If you want to take a snapshot, you can find months in the recession of 2021 where unemployment in some places was 19%. Uh, and there were many unhappy people, and you know this well, um, the veterans especially. We think of veterans as a constituency now, and we forget that there was universal conscription then. That meant there were a lot of veterans. Every dad was a veteran, many, many dads. And many came back wounded uh, from the war, disabled permanently in the period before sulfa drugs and antibiotics. Um, so you have men who are unhappy, wanting something from government, deserving men, a, a, a constituency seeking something. That, those were the late teens and the 20s. In addition, of course, you have the picture of Europe. Industrial America is new. Uh, Russia is becoming communist. Germany might go communist. Their general strikes and riots in the streets here. There was also a, a problem with the government machine, the federal machine. You saw that Olympia Snow, when she resigned just now, said there was a problem in Washington with process, right, gridlock. They had, they, she couldn't make the process work. The, the government machine wasn't right. They had a budget process problem, too, in the early 
20s, that coming out of World War I, and that problem was individual departments and individual constituencies would agree on some spending. Uh, and then they would go and get the president's signature and Congress's would pass on it or the other way, but there was no comprehensive way of overlooking the budget. It was just one child after another coming and making the case for the car keys, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, I meant to say no. So even if a president wanted to say no, he, he couldn't really know what he, what he was saying no to because he didn't have the resources, didn't really have the researchers even, and so therefore he very, very often said yes. Um, so that was a problem as well. Um, you probably know the politicians I named don't have great reputations. Antony uh, mentioned that. Harding is perceived as fatally corrupt. Um, you know in, in Kansas City uh, there was a, an event for veterans, um, Armistice Day, um, and there was a lot of talk already in 1921 about his corruption. Um, Harding, though, gets a bad rap. Uh, he's more complex than that. He, remember, what was he for when he campaigned? He was for normalcy. And again, in school we hear normalcy. That sounds like he's trying to make everyone a cog, right? He, like he's against individuals. That, that sounds, we don't like that. He, that's not what he meant. What he meant was let the environment be more normal. Let the pendulum swing less wildly and then I, can be quirky and fun and invent a couple things or maybe start a business. Normalcy, a normal environment, lets people be individuals. It's the opposite. That was the normalcy that he sought. And then Coolidge had a poor reputation too. He was deemed a uh, vice president right when, when he came. He was deemed not a player, didn't really get Washington, not cool, didn't really get the other senators who ma made mincemeat of him when he had to preside over them. You know what they said about Coolidge what Alice Roosevelt Longworth said, the daughter of Theodore Roosevelt, he looked as though he had been weaned on a pickle. <laughs> so you have the characters, you have the basis for the story. Uh, we start with Harding, a newspaper publisher, Marion, Ohio, he's a senator and a much loved brother in the Senate. Uh, he could chew tobacco, smoke, drink, all that with the guys. Um, these were important things about him, but even more important was that he had run in 1920 on a platform of no. He knew the preconditions he had to establish. Taxes were too high, no, bring them down. The deficits were obscene, bring it into surplus, right? Um, his normalcy was a good normalcy. Um, he didn't really like change. He didn't like reform, and remember the big reform party in that period was the Republican Party. How do we know that? I mean, you want to think about what other presidents have said at inaugurations, and I hope we get to talk about this tomorrow with the teachers. Roosevelt later, Franklin Roosevelt said, remember the phrase, bold, persistent experimentation. Remember that phrase? We need change for change's sake just to get the country going. I'm going to read to you from Harding's inaugural address a decade or so before because it's so different. Here's what Harding told America when he was inaugurated. No system will work a miracle. Any wild experiment will only add to the confusion. Our best assurance lies in efficient administration of our proven system. Very conservative. And at, at first Harding proved good at saying no. Uh, he picked a strong budget cutting treasury secretary, Andy Mellon. He and Mellon cut the tax rate from the 70s to the 70s. I told you it was bad. Uh, down to the 50s, he vetoed new spending, even veteran bonuses. Harding rallied the Senate to do these difficult things. And also important overlook was that he changed the tool of government. We spoke before about the budget problem. He signed a new budget law, the Budget and Accounting Act of 1921, that gave the executive more authority to control, more oversight, more transparency, and the ability to cut. Before Harding, there were those congressmen running around with those constituents, and the president was kind of a, a weak, a weak, in a weak position. Now, when, with this law that he signed, the president had the overview. He had his own research office, which was the forerunner to our modern OMB, what Mitch Daniels used to have, so he could 
collect data, no data. And the wonderful thing about this 1921 law was it gave the president the power to impound money that had already been appropriated. So you would overlook, just as at work, your employee and see that you had allocated him four pencils for the year, but that he was only using 3.5. I'll take the stub. It was said of the, his budget directors, I think the first one was, they were called general, because I gave him, he got generals, right? And gave them authority that they would go around and take the pencils out of the drawers. It, it was an enormous effort to cut government, and the statute now said that the executive could do that, executive review. You see tremendous progress as a result of this under Harding. The debt begins to be paid back. Mellon is organizing that. Unemployment comes down. Uh, there was a wicked recession, but it just about ended. Nobody remembered it. It's the forgotten recession because it passed so fast. But always, uh, as did now, the determining factor with the president it, it, is, is what? Is it his ideology? No. It's his temperament, right? This is who he is, his temperament. Harding was a complicated man. While his mind and his party wanted him to say no, his temperament was yes. I told you, right? Nice guy, friendly guy, senator. The same skill that got him to get the other brethren to pass that difficult budget law was a skill that got him in trouble in other areas. He was too good a friend. He tried to please people too much. He didn't want to say no to friends from Ohio, especially. And uh, some people thought the country should have recognized this about Warren earlier. One was his dad, who kind of made a dirty joke about his son, Warren Harding. He said it was a good thing Warren wasn't born a girl, because he'd always be in the family way. You know, what do you do with temperament? As a result of temperament, he got tired of saying no, of demonstrating, of being, mm. his health ran out. Harding got tired of tax cutting, and there, he told his advisor, so, well, we got 20 points down from 70-something, 50-something. That sounds pretty good. Now we have a surplus. Why should he need to continue working? They did get a surplus. The budget was way down. So when you give Harding that credit, he actually reduced government. Uh, wasn't that enough, um, you know, and he was having trouble. His Veterans Bureau uh, chief, Charles Forbes, was running around taking kickbacks, and he was just beginning to discover that. Harving was for what we would call privatization, make government smaller, right? That's really what Teapot Dome was. There was this oil, the naval, the naval oil, right, out there, Teapot Dome. You want it to be in the private sector. But that, that effort to privatize Novogo was besmirched by the way that Harding did it. One company got a concession. All around that company were people who were backers of Harding, right? Um, and uh, so this was a typical, a typical Harding situation. Um, he had a good idea, but the way he executed it made it less effective. Um, he was supposed to defend prohibition, you were. But the drinking was very heavy at the White House. He, we would invite people to the White House for what, what he himself called food and action. Uh, <laughs> and the senators loved him. And they couldn't believe he'd bring such a country bumpkin, a sourpuss, a Scrooge, as Coolidge from Massachusetts with him to preside over them. He liked to please fellows. But it got worse and worse with the scandals and the tired. And he, he had a wonderful quote. He said, I have no trouble with my enemies. I can take care of my enemies in a fight. But my friends, my GD friends, they're the ones who keep me walking the floor at nights. And his efforts began to fizzle. And Harding did die in early August 1923. He was literally what Coolidge said. Coolidge was, was perspicacious, tired out. Um, and you know, you know where Charles Forbes ended in Leavenworth, right? I mean, it was, it was a sad story in a way to a good start. But enter uh, tonight's hero. Coolidge, the quiet president elected on the same ticket, different type, Vermonter, who was sworn in then by kerosene light, kerosene light, we're gonna say candle, by kerosene light by his father, a notary public. He, 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 he was from there, from the true country, and he liked it, and he, that was part of who he was. Harding smiled beautifully, you liked him when you met him, 
Coolidge intentionally kept his face expressionless. This irritated the portrait artists who tried to paint him. Clarence Barron noticed that it was hard to capture Coolidge's soul. He held his soul back from you. His, the ladies of Boston said his handshake was a little bit like a codfish. Um, he, was, he was a cold seeming person and he came now to Washington from his Vermont retreat. The president gone, became the new president, moved in the White House. Um, and right away, people began to notice distinctions. One was Charles Evans Hughes, Secretary of State, came over to visit the White House, of course, new president, a few times that summer and that on. And, and he wrote, and you can go back and look in, in the notes, whereas Harding had never been alone, always with somebody, Coolidge often was alone in the White House with papers and a cigar, whereas Harding made decisions in groups like conference calls, so to speak, the friendly, friend. Coolidge made them alone. And in that he resembled, by the way, Woodrow Wilson. Liked to think himself, and, and even uh, Hughes even wrote this down, whereas Harding had said yes to everything when you approached him, with Coolidge it was almost always no. Some presidents are foreign policy presidents, some presidents are conciliation presidents, some presidents are law presidents. Coolidge was a budget president. He instantly um, shocked, shocked colleagues by, by his toughness. Uh, they kind of thought they were done with saving. I told you they were getting to surplus, right? The budget surplus. They were cutting the debt already, but maybe we, we can relax now. Nope. And I'll read to you um, from some things he said to get a feel for his tone. We must have no carelessness in our dealing with public property, Coolidge said, or the expenditure of public money. Such a condition is characteristic of undeveloped people. <laughs> what about um, being done with tired? You know, let's stop now. Uh, no, no, I am for economy, and after that I am for more economy. Mm. So he proceeded to continue the job, the policy job Harding started. Uh, there were those taxes in the 50s, top rate. Well, that was too high. He wanted to cut the tax rate. He went over to Mellon. Very similar um, in demeanor. It was said, two guys who didn't talk, working hard. It was said uh, that neither of them spoke a lot. And it was said that Mellon and Coolidge conversed in pauses. <laughs> what did they want to do? They wanted a better tax code. They didn't work for one week or five days and have a good weekend. They worked for about a quarter of a year, half a year, on this tax reform. They had a specific idea. They wanted to flatten the progressivity. They wanted to reduce the taxes on productive labor, especially labor at the top, higher earners who might create jobs if their taxes were not so high. Um, cabinet officials in that period weren't accustomed to writing books, instant books. That's not something necessarily Andy Mellon would have thought of himself. He is not a natural talker. But Mellon wrote a whole book in this period about tax cuts. Um, and the argument for tax cuts, it's called taxation colon, the people's business. And it's one measure of the value of his ideas that if you go on AB Books right now and try to buy that book, you will see that the real good copies of it go for over $1,000. That was an effort. Um, and they pushed their legislation and they went to Congress and guess what? They did not succeed. Congress sabotaged them. They put too many cuts at the bottom and not enough at the top. And guess who failed them in that regard, though he was a good fellow? Nicholas Longworth, the husband of Alice Roosevelt. He kind of made a compromise that was too much of a compromise for Andy Mellon's and uh, Calvin Coolidge's scientific taxation. Did they give up? Nope. Coolidge signed a law he didn't like, ran for president, 24, won in another tax bill. He's going to do another tax bill. He and Andy worked on it. What did he use? to get this tax bill through. He worked on Congress. He used the new media. Did he tweet? <laughs> no, but he made a video, which is still around on YouTube. You can see Coolidge talking um, in, somewhere in this period about the importance of low taxes. Um, and this tax cut was a beautiful tax cut. The top rate is 25%. The schedule's pretty flat. Um, the nice thing about this cut um, you know the arguments about tax cuts, they benefit the rich, is that distributionally, we look at the distribution table, see who pays taxes, 
after the Coolidge Mellon tax cuts, the rich paid a greater share of taxes than they had before. So it's very hard to make the argument it was an unfair tax cut. For Coolidge, this was supposed to be a way of saying no to government. He was cutting taxes so his government would get less revenue. I think he was a little disconcerted himself to find that more money came in. The supply siders were right. They didn't call them that then, but Andy, because it, this method, this was Andy Mellon's wager, this method of taxation was efficient. People would be more active when they had less burden in tax to carry. And Coolidge, this was perturbing to Coolidge because he didn't like way, so he would, he, and Mellon would instantly write legislation, give the money back in a rebate. Today, a rebate is for stimulus, right? Then the, a rebate was for give the money back because it was the people's money in the first place. It's a different <laughs> argument. So the cutting becomes more difficult, right? You can't keep cutting. How much can you keep cutting? But he wants to uh, cut. Uh, they had a figure. They wanted the government to be $3 billion, and they kept going cutting and cutting. And you look and you see Coolidge was pretty skilled at the pocket veto and other subtle tricks of government. He knew them well. And Jerry and I were just talking about this. Coolidge was not an outsider. He was a lifetime politician from 19... 05, even before, no, from before the, we're on the turn of the century, right? He had his first government job and he went up all the way from small official in Northampton, Massachusetts, up Massachusetts to the, uh, to the, to the governor of Massachusetts and then vice president. He, he barely spent a year of his adulthood not in office. And this stood him in good stead with the legislation. He thought about it a lot. Many politicians with experience used that experience to make government bigger. Coolidge was the opposite. He wrote to his father even before he became president. Um, when his father was a lawmaker in Montpelier, Vermont, it is better to veto a bad law than to sign a good one. Use your skill to keep it down. He stilled the pendulum. So you hear silent Cal, he was silent because he was weird. He was silent because he was quirky. He was silent because his mother died too young. Mama. You know, you, you hear these things. Silent Cal was silent Cal. It was his temperament, but it also had a purpose because he, he saw that when, what is the presidency? It's, it's, it, being a president is some, you're, some, you're besieged, right? Every day, every hour, somebody wants something from you. You sit there. They don't come in there because they like you, right? They're, they're mendicants. People come in your office after something. What is your job if you're for smaller government? It's to say no. How do you say no? Coolidge was silent because, as he told his colleagues, if you're silent, the people talking at you begin to wind down pretty fast. <laughs> right? And... Uh, that functioned. Um, he was silent. He was with the media a lot, but he was silent or boring with them too because he didn't want them to get to everyone to get all excited and have reform, change government, maybe make it bigger. Um, and the journalists didn't all get it. Well, one journalist got it kind of sort of, Walter Lippmann, and, and he wrote this. It's, it's wonderful about the way Coolidge suppressed activity and expansion of government. The White House is extremely sensitive to the first symptoms of any desire on the part of Congress or of the executive departments to do something. The skill with which Mr. Coolidge applies a wet blanket is technically marvelous. There has never been Mr. Coolidge's equal in the art of deflating interest. The naive statesman imagines it's desirable to interest the people in their government, that indignation at evil is useful. But Mr. Coolidge is more sophisticated. He has discovered the value of diverting attention from government. And with an exquisite subtlety that amounts to genius, he has used dullness and boredom as political device. <laughs> Often, uh, precisely because Coolidge was sharper, people said he was stupid, because he was a lot sharper than the credit that he was credited with. He used his wit to kill projects or in treaties. He got to the point where he could penalize people for even asking, so penalty. Uh, and he had New England humor, which is different from ours. I'm from Chicago, even though I'm from New York. Um, but, so I'm going to read you something and see if you can hear it. Um, he, he really didn't like it when they went on and on in their entreaties asking him for things. So someone came to ask about uh, a, uh, an ambassador's post. 
and went on and on and on and on. And, and finally, at the end, this, this eloquent person who had been engaged to represent the would-be ambassador said, I'm sure you were aware of the many considerations in his favor before the candidate. And Coolidge replied, yes, less now. Another uh, Coolidge rule for keeping government quiet or consistent of saying no, um, in a crisis, follow the same policy you followed before. What, what does that mean? That's a very difficult thing to do. The crisis that they had, their Katrina, was the flood of the Mississippi in 1927. Terrible flood, water 20, 30, 50 feet high. Many, many people displaced. Bad news, many states. Uh, we had photography for the first time, or one of the first times, so it could be shown how bad it was. Should a president go down? Is it right for a president to go down? Well, Coolidge didn't think so because of federalism. He didn't think the government should really pay for the disaster either. He thought the government's role was to lead in the disaster, which is different than pay. And he sent his Commerce Secretary, a very active, energetic yes-sayer, Herbert Hoover, down to lead the Red Cross, and they raised considerable money, but they did not spend, mostly not, government money. Well, that was a controversial decision even then for a president, uh, and it was tested, Coolidge was tested, because the very same year, his own state, Vermont, had a terrible flood, and the lieutenant governor was killed. What are you supposed to do when your president in your home gets hurt? Well, you're supposed to show you're humane and run home and help them and maybe get them, um, you know, the Olympics, right? <laughs> get them something big <laughs> to make it all better. It did, but, but Coolidge wanted to be consistent. If he didn't go down the Mississippi to see the people there, well, he shouldn't go to Vermont. There's some compelling photographs that Jerry may have seen in Plymouth Notch, Vermont, that were taken of his town during the flood, his town was not hurt. Um, but he saw the aerial photographs of his town. He was very wistful about it, but he, he didn't go. Um, and that was hurtful because he wanted to be there and because it made him look terribly inhumane. You know, that, that's the price of it. Um, other things that I should mention. Um, one is uh, this, the incredible discipline it takes to oversee that cutting. You can't cut carelessly. You have to know what you're cutting. And for this, um, one of the exciting things about the Coolidge book is we, we did some research um, with the Library of Congress and with the National Archive. And one of the things we got was Coolidge's diary. And I'm thinking maybe even Jerry told me about this too because we wanted to count how many times he met with his budget director because that would show how serious he was about budgeting. And we did that, Jerry. These meetings were important because they came before the cabinet meeting, and if he was going to say no to the cabinet, he better know what he was saying. Um, and we found that in 1923, which is a part year because he just became president, there were 14 meetings with the budget director, but the following year, which is a full year of presidency, there were 53, I think, uh, I'm careful. And the next year, there were 55 every week, sometimes more than once a week, because remember there are holidays, 52 meetings in 1925, 63 meetings in 1926, 51 meetings with his budget director in 1927. Did he feel like doing that? No. Why did he do it? He had to justify the cuts. Uh, something else remarkable, um, and I think this will conclude it for you because it's so different from our culture now. Twice a year, the president, and Harding started this, but Coolidge continued it, and his budget man, General Lord, called a budget meeting with the government cabinets and their staffs uh, near the, by the DAR, and sat them all down to a command performance in a room like this, and they couldn't leave. They had to listen. And the budget director, General Lord, would march up and down and tell the people how bad they were. <laughs> they weren't saving enough in the departments. They're, but they're, oh, we're spending just our budget. Well, that's not enough. You need to save. And if you go, and one of the things we did was photocopy all these lectures by the budget director with the president there, praising them for saving some and exhorting them to save more. And the quotations from poetry and scripture and, you know, Invictus and you name it. Very, very um, le much lecturing and patronizing relative to the way we convey information now. 
Um, and to get the money saved, you know, they thought they had to treat the cabinet like a bunch of kindergartners. And they did treat them like kindergartners. They gave them little certificates. You know, first they created 2% club. You got a paper if you, you cut 2% more from your budget. Well, after a while, they couldn't do that anymore because people had cut so much, so they created a 1% club. And you got, I don't know what, a sticker? <laughs> if, if, you, if you were able to cut your budget down 1%, and after a while, they couldn't get to 1%, they were, so they created the Woodpecker Club. Grown cabinet members and their, their departments. And the Woodpecker Club, well, you, you're good if you peck away at your budget here and there when you can do it. Yeah, but if the post office cuts the size of the paper for the money order or something like that, that was a big deal. Um, and they, they, they essentially were constructing an incentive structure for their department heads to say no. Coolidge also personally practiced what he preached. Uh, he made budgeting part of his life. You know that he lived in a two-family house that he rented even through the presidency. He was not an owner. This was disgusting to the New England aristocracy who looked down on him. You know, Henry Cabot Lodge could not believe that someone in a two-family house would become president or something like that. But that was their form of demonstrating savings. Um, there was a housekeeper at the White House, Mrs. Jaffray, who had been there for a few presidents. She was a fixture, and she, she favored delicatessens. She went around in a horse and carriage. And she shopped in the good stores for the White House. And President Coolidge didn't like that. Budget man, right? Didn't like that. And he noticed um, that. And he ha had his eye on the Piggly Wiggly, the new supermarket concept. He liked that economy of scale, maybe cheaper, right? We could reduce what we're spending. And he noticed uh, she bought uh, one night too many hams for a dinner, and very soon, uh, Mrs. Jaffray was casualty uh, to our president, and she was no longer at the White House. And suddenly, Miss Riley was there, and Miss Riley understood. And we have Miss Riley's papers. Uh, they're in Barrie, Vermont. They used to be in Plymouth Notch. Um, it, how she saved each each document. And then she went each dinner, what it cost. And um, she showed her boss what she was doing. And there's a handwritten White House memo, some type, uh, from 1926, 1927, and written to it for 1926. It says, the feeding at the White House, remember there were a lot of guests at the White House, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of guests, cost $11,667.10 in 1926, which displeased Coolidge. And Miss. Riley got it down in the next year to 9,11639 cents, a total savings of well, about $2,500. And she was rewarded with a note from the president to Miss Riley, very fine improvement. <laughs> did, did the, you know, he, this was fun. Um, he, he advertised his cutting. They got lion cubs. Uh, you can find in Time Magazine, present from South Africa. What did they name them? Budget Bureau and Tax Reduction. <laughs> Those went together for Coolidge. You couldn't just have the tax cuts without the budget reduction. Um, they trained, a, there was a trained parrot to ask, where is that appropriation? Like, you know, <laughs> like a department and Coolidge laughed at that. Um, did it, the, his sourness, his rejection, his no saying hurt his relationship with Congress? You bet. We know that uh, FaceTime with the chief executive is what everyone wants. I work now in the world of President Bush. People still want FaceTime with President Bush, believe me. They are dying for FaceTime. Wow, Coolidge afforded FaceTime. He had Vermont breakfast with maple syrup from his own lime kiln lot. And he invited senators and congressmen who were supposed to come, right? And they were supposed to want to do it. But for some reason, those senators and congressmen didn't want to come. Oh my goodness. And Ike Hoover, who didn't like him, the usher in the White House, a little bit mean, kept all the excuses the lawmakers gave rather than come for breakfast at the White House. And I'll read them to you from one breakfast. Senator Heflin regrets sick. Senator Norris unable to locate. <laughs> Senator Pittman regrets sick. Senator Reed of Missouri regrets sick friend. <laughs> so rarely has FaceTime re been rejected in, in such a fashion. They didn't w just not like him because he wasn't a player, because he was strange, because he they didn't like him because he didn't give them anything. 
That's what it is. So now you understand Alice Roosevelt, the daughter of an activist president with a slightly more activist husband than Coolidge. It wasn't his sour face of Coolidge that she didn't like. It was his policy. But the voters liked him, and they rewarded him. <laughs> Jerry uh, was emailing me that this county went for Coolidge in 24, and quite stunningly. Um, we remember in 1924, sort of a Ross Perot situation. There was La Follette, the third party, and usually then you only get a plurality. Well, Coolidge got absolute majority nationally in that election. Democrats and progressives together did not have as many votes as Calvin Coolidge. Um, there he was, and the Republicans went with him. You can spend a whole talk about what was behind this. Uh, I would say a deep religious faith is important and not often discussed. Uh, so deep, he had, uh, as now, a faith so deep that it bothered some of his colleagues because they didn't understand it. Hoover used to grumble, Herbert Hoover, that Coolidge was fundamentalist, and he didn't mean it quite as a compliment. But to to Coolidge, his faith meant that he understood there were spheres where government ought not to go. One of the spheres is the sphere of the spiritual. He saw that, the spirit, that there is a tension between government and towns, government and states, government and the private sector, and government and the spiritual. He recognized that, that tension. Um, and often people came to the White House, went out with him. They didn't go to a party. They went to church. And often when they didn't wear the right suit, he would tell them what color they should wear. Uh -huh. He believed in service, too. That's important. Job is more important than the man. Um, in my Coolidge book, I talk about where he learned that, um, uh, where he first thought about it. Um, that's why he didn't choose to run in 1928, an act which offended his party mightily because he would have won. Um, there was a center called Selden Spencer from Missouri, too, um, who captured this. He was walking with Coolidge, and I'm trying to figure out when, but I, it seems to be around the time when there was a tragedy. Coolidge's son died, and he was trying to cheer Coolidge in any way. In any case, and he pointed to the White House, to the president. Look, White House, big, fine house. Who lives in that house, Mr. President? Isn't that a pretty house for someone to live in? And Coolidge said, nobody. They just come and go. Right? That perception. What service. It's the office, not us, who is great. Um, well, we can make a, a good list of what we can take away with this for today. Um, value of plain language. You look at his sentences. They are short and clear. He cut through the budget language in part because he was a plain talker, a lawyer, but a plain talker. We want a leader who's a plain talker. There's a lot you can hide, especially in fancy language about finance. Um, the second is that you've got to fight. It's important to fight like heck against a new entitlement. It was very hard for them to fight against uh, the veterans because they love the veterans over, over the bonus. But the bonus would have been establishing a government pension. And that was too expensive, they reckoned, and they didn't want to do it. They did it, but it took a lot of work. You've got to fight like heck for the things that you want. Every president recalls a sports image. Um, TRs, man on horseback always. It's sort of anachronistically, Coolidge is, to me, a windsurfer because his refraining, his no saying, looked easy, right? Windsurfing looks easy. Then you try and realize the great strength it took. We've learned that it is not easy for an executive to refrain and that we want someone who does ha want to make the effort to refrain. Um, two other things that would be very important for a new president to have if we could get it. One is budget experience. They can't necessarily learn it all in that crucible on the job. So, and what you say, but well, that's not important for the chief executive. Oh, deputies can do that. But in a time of crisis, like after World War I, like now, you want someone who understands pretty early and is willing to put the time in with the budget. If they've done it before, it's much easier. Coolidge had worked on cutting departments following a constitutional reform in the state of Massachusetts. He'd already been through a few painful experience with, experiences with budgets, also in Northampton. So that helped him. It was important. It was harder for Harding, who hadn't had that experience. So that suggests to you that the candidates who care about budgets are more interesting. Um, you want a leader. 
I, I think the one law that I take away from all of this is that budget law, which was undone, as you probably know, in the 1970s um, the, it, with our new CBO law. You want, uh, th these budget laws have some use. We should not just think of them as gimmicks. We probably need a new Graham-Rudman or 1921 law, some form of that. We should take it seriously. Um, and finally, that it takes political courage Alf Landon, um, you know, was a wonderful man, but it was said that his campaign was New Deal light. And that's one reason he lost. He was too much like Roosevelt. Happened the economy turned up a bit the year Alf Landon was running in 36, and that made it much harder for Landon to win. Coolidge did not run like Landon. He ran different. And he said, don't be afraid to lose. In the longer run, it's better to stand by your principles. He said, um, you know, in one of those bidding competitions, um, when the Republicans were beginning to seem like the Democrats, when the American people make a major decision like the election of a president, they do not offer themselves to the highest bidder, but seek to determine conscientiously what justice and true patriotism require them to do. That is, take the voters seriously. Don't. Think he, he just thinks you're, you know, a, someone, Santa Claus handing out toys. There are many other things to say about Coolidge, including where he made mistakes, and I, I address that uh, quite a bit in, in the Coolidge book. But I want to say that this Scrooge, this man, Coolidge, uh, made me very optimistic because our troubles are in some ways less than the troubles of the country after World War I. So I will close by saying our task is easier than there. And you ask me whether it's really possible to find leadership and get the country back to what we used to consider uh, stable, normal. I'm going to say at the end of this talk about no, yes. Thank you very much.